Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, her works shine a light on what some might consider the ordinary in life. But in her eyes, the ordinary is extraordinary. A conversation with poet, novelist, and essayist Naomi Shihab Nye, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. Ever since she could understand words, my guest today wanted to play with them. Naomi Shihab Nye has been writing poems and getting them published since she was in elementary school. In her adult life, the prolific author has penned or edited more than 30 works of poetry, essays, and fiction. She's known for her ability to elevate seemingly common objects, events, and people. As one reviewer put it, she often pulls gold from the ordinary. Much of Nye's work is informed by her cultural heritage. Her father was a Palestinian refugee and by the diversity around her in San Antonio, Texas, where she lives. Her collections of poetry include Red Suitcase, Words Under the Words, Fuel, You and Yours, and 19 Varieties of Gazelle, Poems of the Middle East, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Nye is also the author of the children's book City Secrets and the young adult novel Habibi, both of which draw on visits she made to see her Palestinian grandmother in the West Bank. I talked with Nye at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. For more than 15 years, the conference has been bringing together authors and artists to share their works. I began by asking her to explain how she started writing. You have written since you could write. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is yes. that right? Since you were about six? Since I was six, I, I wanted to write. Uh, I fell in love with poetry before I could write, simply from hearing it. I was one of the lucky children who had people reading to them as a child and um, hearing Emily Dickinson before I could read for myself was very transporting or Carl Sandburg, Langston Hughes, you know some of the voices that carried me away, Robert Louis Stevenson, I loved him. Um, and so once I learned to write, you know that sort of dull period in first grade when you're in the cat hat, I mean it should be the most ecstatic moment of your life but I remember being stuck like with making an and many more times than I wanted to. The, you know, um, I started writing poems in the margins, you know, the minute I could, could even write a word. I, I just knew it was what I needed to do. And you have a great little poem that expresses how you started. Please describe how you became a writer. Possibly I began writing as a refuge from our insulting first grade textbook. Come, Jane, come. Look, Dick, look. Were there ever duller people in the world? You had to tell them to look at things? Why weren't they looking to begin with? I think it was some sort of, you know, spin-off of that that caused me to immediately begin writing poems on my, you know, addition page. One plus one equals two. And down here, you know, I start writing a poem about being on a train or Chicago or something I'd moth seen. Flying a moth flying around. Yes, that my cat, um, you know, just all little little things started coming onto my page as, as soon as I had a page. And you started publishing early. I did. I, I was an early publisher, and I, I had, uh, am very grateful to librarians uh, who I think are always readier to help us than we might know. You know, I, I always urge kids, talk to a librarian. You know, if you're lost and on an assignment, you're stuck, you don't know how to find something, um, and I'm still one of the old-fashioned believers in going to the shelves and exploring and finding a book that you've never heard of and allowing it to change your life. You know, don't just go looking for the books you've read about on the Internet. Um, the Internet is amazing. I love it. I'm glad it's there. But I still think we should have that, you know, one-on-one -on -one encounter with text. and Or seeing the book right next to the one that you went. Exactly. Uh, seeing the book you thought you were looking for and then finding the book next to it that changes your life. And so early on, it was librarians who said to me, well, if you like to read so much and you seem always to be writing over there at that table, you might want to send some of your work out too. And I, I remember saying, I could? How would I do that? And you know, the librarian painstakingly 
telling me the process of, well, here's the address in a magazine, and always include a self-addressed stamped envelope. And so at the age of seven, I began sending things out, did not tell my parents. My mother was very concerned when she saw letters arriving in the mailbox addressed to me in my own handwriting. She thought I was, you know, having some kind of psychic experience or a break where I was now writing to myself in the mail. And I said, no, no, no. That's some of my work I've sent to a magazine. And I remember she was shocked. What? But um, after maybe sending out 10 different envelopes, one of my poems was accepted for a magazine. And it just went on from there. To this day, I've never had a publishing agent. Well, one of the wonderful things that you have done, and we can talk about it in a moment, is that you have helped young people publish their own works in anthologies, that you've kept that going. And I, to see their own poem in, in print must be extremely powerful. It's an amazing experience to be the editor of an anthology um, because you, you have, you know, the full selection is yours, but to be able to tell someone else that you've selected one of their pieces um, for a book and then to have a conversation about that is just a remarkable experience. How have we gotten to the point where I'm sure you hear quite often, well, I'm not a poetry person, but I right. like XXX, or I don't understand poetry, or it's, it's too difficult for me, and yet these children are writing poems. What happens between the child and the adult where people seem to stray away from poetry? Well, I love the answer William Stafford, one of my favorite poets, used to give. Uh, when people would say, when did you become a poet, he'd say, no, that's not the question. The question is, when did you stop being a poet? Because all little children are poets. If you listen to the, the elastic ways they experiment with language and put words together and make metaphors without any you know, embarrassment, um, you will see that they are um, operating in a realm of figurative language all the time. And, and so poets just try to develop habits you know, that will allow us to keep doing that you know, after language becomes more routine or more rational. Um, and yes, I do hear those comments. I heard it 25 times today already, people who said, I almost didn't come to your reading because it was poetry. But I'm glad I did because it invited me in. I understood your work. And uh, uh, I've always been interested in, in poems that are you know, easily accessible to many people. Um, that doesn't mean simplistic. It doesn't mean stupid. It means uh, just welcoming. You know, befriending, poems that want to befriend many ages, many people. So I guess when I make anthologies, I look for a similar kind of work um, written by students of any age. I've heard you say that writing poems is like living life twice mm -hmm. because you, you're, you're reliving, you're seeing, really truly seeing when you write down what are seemingly mundane things, a fig, an olive, some clothes on a line. Right. That's important to your poetry, is it not? Very important. And those, those little things, um, they, they carry us away, and, and they connect us to one another, and, and they have, have all kinds of um, possibility you know, within them. I, I really think sometimes you know, nothing is ordinary. The, 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 the fact that we are living is so astonishing when you think of you know, the details of you know, how a single person, human being, comes into being. I mean, even the fact that any one of us would be born, I could think about that forever. How is this possible, you know, that this person was born? And, you know, I think writing is such a useful tool for every human being because it helps us, it helps us focus. You know, so much happens to us, within us, around us every day. It's really hard to think deeply about all of it. You have to develop a little bit of a cavalier attitude. You know, I will walk across, um, the street in Sun Valley without, you know, paying attention to every little exquisite <laughs> bit of beauty that is available to me here. I was going to ask here. you about that as a matter so of fact. So beautiful here. <laughs> and, and, you know, you think I'm looking up at the mountains, I'm looking down at the flowers, the ducks, the ponds, the air, the trees. Uh, and, and anywhere you are, there's so much given. But writing helps you focus on which thing... Um, speaks to you most at that moment. Helps you sift. I've helps you sift, yes. And, and it helps you think and helps you make. You know, I heard during the Sun Valley Writers Conference this weekend so many references to linkage. You know, you connect this thing and that thing. And so many writers doing it in so many different ways. But always linkage is one of the critical elements. I'd love it if you'd read a poem ca that's called Famous, which I think uh, shows in a very simple but beautiful way the attention that you 
put on seemingly mundane things. I wrote this, this poem uh, in response to children's questions to me when I would enter to, to be their speaker for a while. Um, are you famous, Miss? Are you famous? And of course I would want to say, no, I'm your neighbor. I live down the street. Come on. But then I realized to them, if you, if you said yes, it meant they would pay a different kind of attention. So I thought, well, I can't answer the question directly. I have to come up with a little sneaky way to answer it. So this was my answer. The river is famous to the fish. The loud voice is famous to silence, which knew it would inherit the earth before anybody else said so, before anybody said so. The cat sleeping on the fence is famous to the birds watching him from the birdhouse. The tear is famous briefly to the cheek. The idea you carry close to your bosom is famous to your bosom. The boot is famous to the earth, more famous than the dress shoe, which is famous only to floors. The bent photograph is famous to the one who carries it, not at all famous to the one who is pictured. I want to be famous to shuffling men who smile while crossing streets, sticky children in grocery lines, famous as the one who smiled back. I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous or a buttonhole, not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. Um, I, I often think about how everything is famous if you notice it. You know, whatever your eye falls on today is famous to you. And we could all walk, you know, down the block together and different things would take hold of our senses. And just encouraging um, young writers to have an acute and a tender sort of perception of that. Um, it slows you down, and we need to be slowed down um, in a very fast-paced world. And so I think poetry is really a, a powerful avenue for the kind of attention it takes to help us get through our lives, you know, no matter what path we take. In addition to looking at the world around you, do you get ideas just from the news? Very much from the news. I am um, a big newspaper reader. Uh, it's usually how I get my news. But um, sometimes, you know, watching television or reading it on the Internet, too, these days. Um, but, but because I was raised in a family with a journalist and news was always being talked Your father. about. My father was a newspaper man. Um, he urged us to cut out headlines, stories, a story that troubled us, a story we wanted to think more about later. I mean, there was always a scissors in the middle of the dining room table. Oh, you see, so you're like me. You have piles of Piles paper. and boxes and files and things taped into my notebooks, you know. And, uh, you know, I, clipped, I, I pasted in a story this past year that I loved that I haven't written any poem relating to. It's about rats having empathy for one another. I saw that. You saw that story. Yeah. I thought this is a really important story because it was also side by side with all these war stories. Like, well, maybe human beings need to think a little bit more about empathy. You know, the rat is helping its fellow rat do something, and here these human beings are killing one another. Um, so stories like that, you know, I have no idea how that would work into, into something. But, um, but I, I feel that the world around each one of us is so rich, and we, we can only distill or really process, think about, connect little tiny bits of of information. You know, we can't really do the whole bulk of it. So poetry is a way to, you know, kind of enter into scenes and details and, um, you know, kind of a finite horizon of exquisite, hopefully, you know, some kind of language that'll, that'll carry our minds to, to an exquisite, different, other transported place. I know that you've also um, encouraged your students to think about the things that cause you Discomfort, right? Friction, I think, yeah. is the word. Right. Are the things from which you might make, make art. art, and um, you have a quote from William Stafford in your book, "You and Yours," where he says, "What you fear will not go away; it will take you into yourself and bless you and keep you." That's the world, and we all live there. To right. not be afraid right. of friction, tension, war, right, sadness, pain. To write out of your difficult place. Well, that has always been. A lesson conveyed by by many writers, and um, you know, not not wait 
till things are more perfect, but right out of the trouble, wherever it is. One of the other things that I notice in your poems is that they describe parallel lives. You know, while we're living, somebody else is living their life. Right. And in particular, you've written a lot about being a Palestinian American, um, drawing attention to the, the people in the West Bank, um, people, Arab, Arabs all over the world. All over the world. Right. Um, and I know that during the, the war in Iraq, you have shared those poems with students, and they have been kind of amazed that there are, you know, it's opened their eyes up that there are other little kids in other worlds. So right. there's this empathetic quality of poetry. Right. It, it allows us to remember that the headlines are not fully representative of, of the people of a place. You know, a terrible headline uh, does not re represent all the the children and grandmothers and families and regular people who got up that morning and just had an intention to live a decent regular life and you know hopefully work and play and learn and so i think i think poetry in times uh, when headlines are just you know flashing constantly before our eyes poetry takes another um, step of importance just to keep reminding us of of mutual humanity and sort of reduce that, that fear, anxiety level about other places in the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's often so grievous to read a news story and just think, um, as my father used to say, what perspective are we not hearing in this story? Who is not being quoted? Um, this is how it might have looked to our reporter, but how did it look to the person standing over there? you know, on the other bank. And, um, you know, to have a more full, balanced human perspective um, in these days when, you know, even within communities, we have these these issues that pit us against one another or within states um, right now in our country with, you know, a lot of political talking and advocacy. And, you know, no matter where you are, it's it's important to be reminded of other humanity. After 9-11, um, you've written that you just, you felt as if you needed to do something as a writer. I know you wrote a, a letter to would-be terrorists, yes. reaching out saying, please understand that, you know, there are people that care, Israelis as well. Right. Um, and you wrote poems directly about 9-11. Right. In an attempt to, what, connect people? Well, to connect people and to have, you know, just a sense of voice. Because I think we were all so speechless about, you know, cruel behavior that we can't even fathom how people can do such things to one another. So, you know, in order not to remain speechless and, and feeling my own father's pain um, about people from the Middle East being connected to such a horrible tragedy and, you know, crime... Um, you know, I, I felt a need to speak in, in, a, in a personal way to, um, to anyone who would even think of, of, um, of acts, but also I felt it important, uh, of terrible acts against any other people, anywhere. Um, I felt it important to write in that intimate letter style, you know, saying, I know what you would eat, I know what foods you like, I know what music you would listen to, please listen to me for a minute. And by the way, that, that piece when I wrote the letter, I didn't know what to do with it. So I tried an experiment. It's been interesting because I've only done this twice. Um, and I just sent it to maybe five friends on the internet and said, feel free to send it to anyone you like. And I do think the two pieces I did that with in my life have traveled farther than anything I ever had published in a book or magazine or paper. It's really been interesting. You know, I've translated had, into Arabic? Maybe? Translated into yeah. Arabic, translated into Chinese, posted in a Japanese Buddhist temple. I mean, just all the reports I've had back about wh where people have encountered this thing. It's been amazing. And to think, you know, I didn't even make any, you know, like official effort to publish it. Just sort of send it into the air, which was the feeling we all had then, you know, wanting to send into the air, you know, our, our care, our anguish, our sorrow. I think it's our job as human beings to keep extending our empathy or our opinions, um, it confounds me how much some people look for other people who exactly match them. Um, 
I don't know why that's so fascinating. I was always much more fascinating in some, fascinated in someone who was, you know, a little different, who grew up in a different type of household or, you know, had opinions and um, life stories that I knew not of. That's fascinating. Uh, it's not fearsome. So finding ways to exchange that and not, you know, just kind of pitting ourselves against the other as a, as a scary individual. And after 9-11, you wrote about what are, what are good Arabs supposed to do now? Yeah, right. Yeah, wh what about all the people? You know, I felt that, that all the people of the Middle East were in some ways victimized, or all the immigrants um, from Muslim countries and Arab countries to the United States had been placed into a new position of suspicion. Um, how unfair that was. You know, so many decent people leading gentle lives suddenly to be um, looked at with more concern. You write very directly about the Israeli-Palestinian, whatever we want to, word we want to use, yeah, situation, problem, problem, story, crisis. Yeah. Um, when I read your poems, I sense the anger, I sense frustration, but I also sense hope, which I understand your father always had. Always had, never gave up. Your grandmother had. Right. And you still have? I have very strongly. Yes, I do. And um, I think it's important for those of us who've, who've kind of lived with thinking about that situation for a long time but do retain hope to keep, to keep voicing it. Because if people only read headlines sometimes, you might imagine that you know, all the citizens uh, believe in what the politicians say or some you know, stance uh, represents everyone, and we know that it does not. So you have optimism. I have so much optimism. On the last day of his life, I would like to say this, my father was asked by the, a hospital chaplain, whom he did not have a long-term relationship with, um, so you come from the holy city of Jerusalem, and um, do you have hope that Arab people and Jewish people could ever live together in peace? And he said, of course I do, because I've never yet in my life, and this is my dying father saying this, I've never yet met anyone who woke up and said, of any background, who woke up and said, I hope there will be fighting around my house today. I mean, that is not an impulse that human beings hold, even though yesterday E.O. Wilson did say that there would always be violence um, among human beings because it is in our DNA or our cellular structure somehow. But um, that touched this man so much that after my father's death, he came and found me and said, your father gave me a new dose of hope. Um, he said, these are people who are so close to one another that it is, you know, almost as if their lives, their longings echo one another's so, so profoundly that if politicians would get out of the way, if big money from other countries would get out of the way, if military weapons would get out of the way, uh, people could work it out. He always believed that if Arab people and Jewish people had kind of been left on their own uh, together, they would have worked it out. But there were too many intrusive, you know, opinions from outside. Those are big things to get out of the way. Yeah, really big. <laughs> Politicians and weapons. Very, very hard to get them out of the way. But he had full faith in human beings. And, you know, he was... Um, he lost his home. He lost his home. His family lost all their money. They weren't wealthy, but they did have some money in a bank in 1948, and they lost it. They lost their, you know, really they lost what, what many Palestinians lost, which was that sense of just daily dignity, that I am, you know, a person to be respected like any other person. And... Um, some, uh, someone finds it suddenly hard to imagine why it would be attached to my, my house or my tree. You know, anyone who's been cast out or thrown into exile understands that deeply, no matter where you're from. So, Do you consider your poems to be political? I do, yes. And um, I loved the writer Grace Paley, who used to say that politics is simply the way we treat one another, either person to person, country to country, that's politics. So. Um, yes, I think in a very sort of um, down-to-earth way, poems are political because they're, they're caring about detail. And, you know, um, something like war, boom, erases detail or, you know, kind of takes so much away that we can barely grasp how much has suddenly been lost, a bomb falls, what was there, all these lives affected. We read about it every day in the paper in some country or another. Whereas poetry kind of pauses and respects what's there, does exactly the opposite. 
So I want to ask you a little bit about how you write poetry. Um, first of all, do you write longhand still? I do. I write okay. longhand and I often write with pencil in my notebook because I just love that soft feeling and sound of a pencil. I write every day. Um, I'm always taking notes, but then when you know, I'll, I'll go to a new page and start working on a poem, and you know, just lines start finding you. You know, the more you do uh, regular writing, the more will be given to you. So I urge people not to to make their writing time too precious. Don't say in your mind, oh, you know, three weeks from now I'm going to spend a whole day working on poems, because then it'll be there'll be too much emphasis placed on it. Just do it every day a little bit. You know, seven minutes, ten minutes, you can sneak it in. And I find by regular writing, uh, so much is always sort of waiting. Uh, water like to pour through the, the little creek bed there onto the page, the creek of the pencil. Um, anyway, metaphors mixed, but, um, but I do. I write every day. And uh, one of my friends, Kim Stafford, over in Oregon has said, you know, to be a writing person, you need um, really just three things. You need a sense of your own material, a regular writing practice, and some way to share your work. And that could be with one friend who also loves to write, and it could be over the internet, through the real mailbox, um, hand it to your friend in class today. So I'm always urging students to uh, believe that belongs to them, because whatever they do in their lives, if they're a person who feels comfortable with words, it's going to serve them, it's going to help them have an easier time, a better life. So. You know, it's, it's a soapbox, but I've been on it for a long time now, and I really believe in it. And I've, I've had so many adults come up to me in all kinds of places and say, it, you're right, it really mattered. Keeping a notebook became the most important thing in my life. When everything fell apart, language saved me, um, this, that. You know, and so I've had plenty of testimonials that allow me to know that it's not just, you know, a pipe dream of poets. One thing I love about Idaho is you have space here. I live in Texas where we also have space. Some of our cities are overcrowded, but um, you know, to live in a place that has space, I think gives you a, a really precious time uh, to, to have a little solitude, to be alone with language, alone with words, you know, to take a walk and look up at the mountains or the stretches of land and, and feel you know, things resonating in your ear. So um, I always think of it as kind of the margin on the page of the day when you go outside and just, just take a walk and uh, the place holds you. I, I loved that about Idaho from the beginning. Well, thank you very much for visiting us again. We thank hope you'll you. come back. Thank you. I, I think that uh, the Sun Valley Writers Conference is certainly one of the most amazing conferences I've seen in all of my travels, and um, it's an honor to have been here four times now. You've been listening to Naomi Shihab Nye, a poet, essayist, and novelist. I spoke with Nye at the Sun Valley Writers Conference. I'd like to thank the organizers of that event for their assistance and thank you for tuning in. If you'd like to learn more about Nye, watch this program again, or watch past conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference, please check out our website. Go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.